This is the second lecture on psychology of social media. Today we'll talk about what is social influence and how social media can play a role. You might be surprised to realize what little role social media plays in social influence, even in today's day and age. If I asked you what percentage of word of mouth is communicated through social media, what would be your guess? When this question is asked of people, most people say about 50%. Some people say social media accounts for 80% of word of mouth. Some people say social media accounts for 60% of word of mouth. But the majority say that it is about 50%. What is the reality? The reality is that social media accounts for only 7% of word of mouth. Now, let me define what I mean by word of mouth. Word of mouth means that a person buys a product or a service at the recommendation of somebody else. Now you can see why most of that happens face to face. So if I want to buy a laptop, there may be lots and lots and lots of information on social media. There would be lots of advertisements, lots of videos, lots of um, articles, lots of comparisons. Yet a friend of mine tells me that, look, I bought this particular product and it doesn't really work. So do not buy it. That would be a much more important word of mouth for me than all of the other research that I may have done. Similarly, when you're buying a car, phone, or any other object of importance. What about you're traveling abroad, let's say you're going to um, Istanbul and you want to know if you should stay at the Marriott. And somebody tells you that, oh, the Marriott in Istanbul is not that great. Or they say, well, it's an amazing experience. Go stay at the Marriott. Depending on how credible your friend or that colleague is, you are more likely to follow their recommendations than a whole bunch of reviews because we know that a lot of these reviews could also be engineered by the companies involved. That is an important consideration. Word of mouth on the social media is only 7% in terms of its effectiveness. And most word of mouth is face-to-face -face with close friends, colleagues, relatives. Another example of social influence is the idea of six degrees of separation. And that has been a very interesting finding. So let's say, you're in Pakistan, you're in the city of Lahore, and you want to communicate with somebody that you don't know, but who lives in Islamabad. Chances are that you know somebody who knows somebody else, who in turn knows somebody else, till you actually reach the person living in Islamabad. And there are only six people in between. There are six degrees of separation. You can reach anybody in Pakistan, through a contact of 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 a contact. So these are six degrees of separation. So this was very interesting finding for marketeers because they can now target their information in such a way that you could pass it on as word of mouth to somebody else, which means that it might reach a majority of the population through word of mouth. But another important finding of this six degrees of separation research was that mostly people who succeeded in passing on the information are the same for any number of people. So let's say I have a hundred contacts and I want to reach this random person in Karachi. Of those 100 contacts, there will be one person who will know perhaps a thousand people. And so if I want to reach somebody in Karachi, it will be that person who will pass it on to the information to somebody else. And if I want to reach somebody in Peshawar, chances are it will be through the same individual of my 100 contacts. And then if I want to reach somebody, let's say in Gilgit, Baltistan, the chances are that the person who acts as the first degree of separation would be the same individual who helped me reach the person in Karachi or Peshawar. Now this was a very interesting finding. Some people are just more connected than others. And these are called connectors by marketeers. Now, what that means is that if 
I want my word of mouth marketing to be successful. I need to find out who the connector is. And once I reach the connector, I have been successful. So that's one thing that is extremely important for us to grasp. If you quit smoking, chances of a colleague or a friend quitting smoking increase by 40%. But then that colleague and friend knows somebody else. What happens in that case? The chances of that individual, a third degree of separation from you, quitting smoking is 29%. So here is a colleague who's quit smoking. And then there is a colleague of a colleague that you don't even know. Their chances of quitting smoking increase by nearly 30%. So do you realize that just by doing something, anything, you have increased the chances of somebody else that you don't even know doing that thing. You've influenced a person that you don't know through word of mouth. It is the same with buying a product. You buy a product, that information is communicated to your friends and colleagues, to your acquaintances. But that information then passes on to people that you don't even know. And they are indeed influenced by their word of mouth. So the psychology of social influence is fascinating. So the phenomenon of social influence through six degrees of separation is a fascinating one and is now being harvested by psychologists and social media engineers, marketeers. A professor at Wharton School of Business at University of Pennsylvania has developed his own formula for success in creating viral content. And he calls it steps with two Ps. So the first letter S is for social currency. What does social currency mean? Remarkability. Sometimes this social currency or remarkability is created by opposing or violating most of the traditional rules of marketing. What are the traditional rules of marketing? So for instance, driving down to this particular studio today, I saw a big M on the road for McDonald's. That's the traditional rule of marketing. Make yourself visible, create a trigger, form a connection. If I'm hungry, I look at that M, there's a McDonald's right next to it, on the main road, visible, tempting people, creating desire for their food, so on and so forth. So these are traditional marketing strategy. Jonah Berger at Wharton School of Business shared this particular story. He went into this fast food restaurant that specializes in selling hot dogs. These hot dogs could be of many different kinds. Typically, a hot dog is simply a piece of sausage in a bun with some mustard and ketchup. But this particular place specialized in selling breakfast hot dogs with some egg or salmon added to it. They specialize in green chilies with hot dogs and so on and so forth, all sorts of different hot dogs. But then what he noticed was that in that restaurant against a wall was an old style phone booth you know, a red colored box in which a person could barely stand and dial a phone. So he said while he was waiting for this particular hot dog, he went into the phone booth and he noticed that it had an old dial style phone in which you stick your finger in and you dial a number. So he said, well, you know, I was waiting for my hot dog. I said, what the heck? And so I dialed a number randomly and a bell rang and somebody picked up and said, sir, we have still a few reservations left. Would you like a reservation? He said, what reservation? So what he discovered was that the other side of the phone booth opened into a bar. And this bar was named, please don't tell. So they were actually asking people, don't tell anybody about us. Now I ask you, what happens when somebody tells you a bit of juicy gossip and says, please don't tell anybody. What do you do with it? The first thing you do is tell somebody close to you and you tell them, please don't tell anybody about this. So what they are doing was they've got a restaurant or a bar hidden behind a phone booth in another restaurant. And it's called, please don't tell. They're not saying, please share my video, click like, and you know, share it to the widest possible audience. They're saying, please don't share. 
So what are they creating here? They're creating social currency. We are a secret drinking place and only a select few are allowed. They open up their reservation around 3 p.m. and usually within an hour, they are booked up to late at night. So their marketing strategy is, please don't tell. Please don't share this secret with others. We are not situated like McDonald's for everybody, every Tom, Dick and Harry, for every riffraff. We are a special kind of place. And you can only reach us through a hot dog place and a telephone booth. What if you never went into the telephone booth? You weren't curious. You're not going to find us. So that is an example of creating social currency. Another example I would give you is that of the deodorant Axe. When Axe was created, they said that it will make you attractive to women. So what happened? Most people who were very studious or very shy and what the category of people that are called nerds or geeks in Europe and America started to buy it. So what happened was that Axe actually became associated with people who were generally considered not very attractive. And what you found was therefore people who thought of themselves as attractive or thought of themselves as smart stayed away from acts. So this is how some companies create social currency and others lose social currency. The second principle that Professor Berger identified is important signified with the letter T and that is trigger. Now what's a very good trigger in America? You want to sell a particular brand of biscuit that you could have with coffee, you could say something like coffee with Krebs, Krebs being a brand of biscuit. Krebs with coffee, coffee with Krebs, Krebs with coffee. Now what happens is that every time you pick up a cup of coffee, you associate it with that particular brand because they repeat it often enough. There are many TV shows that have titles like breakfast with X, or coffee with somebody, or tea time with somebody. And the reason for that is they, that they want to link themselves with that particular trigger in our daily life. And that is a phenomenon that can be used to make your social media post viral. The third thing Professor Berger presents is emotion. We've discussed the role of emotion in a previous video, so I won't dwell on it too much, but I would just say that we understand that if your post lacks emotion, it's unlikely to make the cut. So please, 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 whenever you're creating something that you want to reach a large number of people through word of mouth or through sharing, try to bring in some emotion into it. And then comes the next P. And that P is for public. So I'll give you an example. Here is a laptop in front of you. And when I put it in front of you like this, or like this, you can see the brand right side up. So they did not put the brand for me. I am not the public they're interested in. I've already bought their product. They want other people who come to my office to see the brand. So therefore, it's not facing me it's facing the public. So that's an example of keeping the public in mind. This is exactly what Apple did. They started out doing it the wrong way, iBooks. When they started out making their laptops, they had the Apple facing the user, but they soon realized that in order to promote the brand to the public, they have to turn it around. So that's what public means. The other P is practical value. Your message should have some kind of practical value. I gave you the example of you only use 5% of your brain or you only use 10% of your brain. Even though this statement is false, it has practical value. It encourages people to think more. It encourages people to motivate themselves and say, I'm going to try and use more of my brain. So even though the statement is false, since it has practical value, it sells, it goes places, it becomes viral. And finally, Professor Berger uses the S for stories. And he says, whatever your message is, wrap it up in a very good story. We've talked about stories earlier. 
But as I told you the story of what he did in the hot dog joint, and it is, I am sure you may forget the rest of this lecture, but you're not going to forget the story of the restaurant that was hidden behind the telephone booth.